Good morning, everyone, and thank you also for coming. Um, today, I would like to share my uh, research on Tibetan with you, and also, more specifically, one specific item of my research on Tibetan typography um, made by the man Ferdinand Teinhardt. But before I continue, I would like to dedicate this talk to my parents, uh, without whom I wouldn't uh, actually start doing type design and typography. So love to your boat and thank you for everything you did. Um, today I'll be talking about this specific person, Ferdinand Teinhardt, uh, who is like a Berlin German punch cutter and type founder. Um, Unfortunately, not much is written about him, especially not in any other language than German. There's a few articles uh, about him, and um, most often he's being associated with also early sans serif uh, type designs, although that it's like questionable. And some people are arguing even that he actually designed sans serif at all. Um, I won't be talking about this in this talk, but. Um, I would kindly refer you to the work of Indra Kupferschmidt, Dan Reynolds, and also Wolfgang Homola, if you want to know more about the whole discussion and the developments about this topic. It's very interesting and very uh, challenging at the same time. Um, I actually want to talk about one specific uh, design he did uh, for uh, the writing system of Tibetan language and also the uh, Bhutanese language. Um, and it, finding source material about it is quite tough and difficult. I, as I mentioned just earlier, there's not much mit written in uh, other languages than German. Uh, there was like a dedication in the book of, uh, on the house of Berthold. Uh, so Hoffman writes about his life and about his uh, career. There's also a story about him uh, made uh, in the uh, history of the um, type foundries in Germany. But the most accurate information I could find regarding to the Tibetan um, aspect of it is actually by an autobiography that he wrote himself in 1899. It was only for a couple of friends that he actually published his own kind of Erinnerungsblatter, it's called. It's like a memories, we would say today. Uh, that was distributed amongst them. And um, to commemorate uh, the centenary anniversary of his uh, birth, it was actually republished by Berthold in 1906. Uh, and he actually tells about how he actually came to be a type founder, what his backgrounds are, uh, is, and I really recommend going through it. It's all written in German, but um, in my doctoral studies and also in the publications that we follow, I translated most of it regarding to the Tibetan aspect of it, so um, it will be available in English soon. Um, the Tibetan typeface that uh, Tainar designed was actually introduced by one specific person to the public, and that was Heinrich August Jeschke. He was a missionary who was sent to North India in the Himalayas, uh, with actually the task to translating the Bible into uh, Tibetan. So he was sent there and uh, in, uh, in assisted by two Tibetan lamas, Buddhist lamas, Gergan Sondam Ganyal and Lama Zöpa Gyaltsel. Um, Jeshke started translating his work already in 1860. Um, but before he actually could uh, do the translation, he needed some um, linguistic material to help him with the job. So at the same time, he also started um, writing and compli um, complying two different um, academic works, which is a grammar book and a dictionary in order to start getting grips with the language. He was a very fluent in different languages. And because he knew about different publications on multiscript typography, he also knew about the existing earlier Tibetan typefaces that were out there. And he was very critical, because being the author of this new linguistic work, he knew about the earliest type Tibetan font that was produced on the left in Rome for the Vatican Press, which is completely out of proportion and also too abstract for Tibetans to read. Also, uh, the work of uh, Joma, who did some interesting lexicographical work, but also uh, his criticism on the type were that it was also not very legible. Um, the one that he was most in favor about was the one from um, 
the Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg in uh, uh, Russia. And um, there is also like a typeface which is very close related to it, which was actually designed and cut by a French punch cutter, which Sébastien earlier already introduced, which is Marcelin Legrand. And for uh, the Imprimerie Royale at the time, if I'm not mistaken, he actually, this, um, or, uh, um, he actually designed uh, a specific two-way typeface for uh, academic publications. However, it resembles very, very close to the one on the left, so it was very much influenced by it. He was also familiar by typefaces uh, for, um, from Vienna, and um, some typefaces which he didn't know about at the time of the publication of its work were the ones by the British type founder Stephen Austin on the right. However, he was in very close contact to a very known linguist at the Academy of Sciences in Berlin. Um, and their communication about the lexicographical work was published in their uh, Monatsblätter, their monthly um, magazine, basically, that writes about um, how to actually do the linguistical work, translations, about the Tibetan. And that man was Karl Richard Lepsius. Now, what was the case with Teinhardt? Teinhardt already collaborated with Lepsius in 1851 because he was not only an important linguist, he was also like an Egypto Egyptologist. And he actually needed a typeface to print hieroglyphic scripts. And Teinhardt actually cast and cut, uh, designed the hieroglyphic font, more than 2,000 individual punches for Lepsius. Steinhardt, uh, sorry, no, Jeschke and uh, Lepsius were in communication about the developments of the uh, work. And um, in the Reichsdruckerei Berlin, there were already some printing types available. Um, but Jeschke didn't want to use that specific typeface for his linguistical work, like the uh, uh, dictionary and the grammar book, because he found it too resembling to the one from... Um, St. Petersburg, but being very much inferior, so of poorer quality. So because he was very precise and very uh, high standards on quality, he actually wanted to have his own typeface for uh, the Bible, Bible translations and um, the lexicographical work. The one from Reichsdruckerei, it's questionable whether Teinhardt uh, cut the types. It's never mentioned, and he did supply some other typefaces for uh, the Reichsdruckerei in Berlin, like the main printing house of the uh, city of uh, the state. Um, but it's never mentioned, and it's 20 years actually before he actually cut the uh, typefaces, uh, the type for Jeschke. However, very recently, um, the punches of this um, Reichsdruckerei, Tibetische, uh, emerged at the archives of the uh, Technique Museum in Berlin, like the Museum of Technology, um, being part of the whole collection of Berthold, which I'll come to a bit later. Um, so it's very good to know that there is some existing material as well. Thanks to Dan Reynolds again for highlighting this. He's doing more research on actually cataloging the cabinets with all the punches that are preserved there. But Jeschke actually started asking for funding. And it was the British Indian government uh, that actually provided the funds to actually go with designing new type for um, his work. Jeschke, as I mentioned before, was very much uh, eager to have very high qualitative work. And he wanted to be original so that the design was not resembling all of the previous not good working typefaces but that they also preserved the xylographic, which is what you see here, like woodblock printing uh, qualities, and also the qualities of uh, the calligraphic hand that is very much regar highly regarded in Tibetan. So he actually provided some sources to um, Teinhardt because of their connection with uh, Lepsius and the hieroglyphics. He was actually the man to actually do the job because he was highly regarded for the specific high quality design of the hieroglyphics, and he actually started working in, uh, on it. Teinhardt actually mentions in his uh, memories, in his um, 
booklet, the Erinnerungsblätter, that he actually used a specific source at the Library of Berlin, the National Library, which is like a manuscript which was written with silver ink on black paper. It's not this one, it's like one that resembles close to it. However, he mentions that it was a 3,000 year old uh, manuscript, and that must be an error because the Tibetan writing system was only introduced in the seventh century, so there must be like a typo mistake or something else happening in um, the publication. But what was more difficult or more important to get grips about is that he had to actually, yeah, understand the complexities is a big word, but still the structure of the Tibetan writing system, which is an abugida or a syllabary writing system, which has all the A vowels inherent in the sounds. And it's written from left to right, and being um, a syllabary, it actually produces some of the um, sounds by also stacking different base characters underneath each other. So you've got the root letter, and at some occasions you can have like a character being positioned in the front, at the end of uh, that root letter or base letter, and even a second one on the one. Uh, to actually produce more sounds or meanings to a character. Uh, you can also stack a character on top the root of the root letter, below the root letter, and on total of this you can have also accents to make a change that actually go on top or below. So it's quite a complicated matter to get grips, like with other uh, writing systems, Indian writing systems that are derived from Brahmic, um, to actually have this working well in a printing type. He succeeded, and the work that he printed uh, first with it, well, not printed, but actually supplied uh, the, the type to, um, was uh, the printing house of the Unger brothers, the Gebruder Unger from Berlin, but they were actually commissioned by the British Foreign Bible Society to do all the printing works for the Bible translations. So the printing house of the Gebruder Unger in Berlin, they really had to supply type to actually do all the translations. And they were the first to actually use the Teinhardt type in the dictionary. And you can also see that the indicators, like the bigger type, uh, was also produced as metal type. But I couldn't find any resources or material or existing type on that one. Uh, here you can see a detail. Um, you can also see some of the Sanskrit uh, writing um, next to some words, and that was also cut by Teinhardt uh, as well. In 1883, the four Bible uh, publications, um, like translations, uh, were published at the same time, following like the traditional method of publishing books in Tibetan, which is like an oblong pecha format, so not the codex format that we know. And here you can see the examples of the first use. Also, Teinert supplied its, um, in the, or, or, or showcased uh, the Tibetan and also other non-Latin uh, writing systems that he created in his uh, specimen books. And here you can see examples here in which you can see also some of the Sanskrit and the Zen type that he did in his Muster, Muster book or the um, uh, major type system and book from around 1890s. He also showcases it with the hieroglyphs that he designed. Specific numerals were designed for him, for the Tibetan. And you can see that even in 1907, the Gebruder Ungers, Ungers were also like introducing or experimenting with creating bigger sizes. Here you can see a combination like with other parts of the Bible. But they not only uh, did biblical publications, they also experimented and printed very high quality um, linguistic words. And here's a combination uh, you can see with Mongolian. And you can see the typesetting is quite complex and uh, difficult here. It's like um, some Buddhist mantras uh, which has specific meaning, so it's quite specific typesetting to do this. Steinhardt supplied through his type foundry because he became an independent type founder in uh, 1849, um, also to other larger printing houses in the continent, in Europe. And one of the first and major users um, of uh, the Steinhardt font was the Oxford University Press. And on the right, you can see Horace Hart. 
He was not only a printer at the Oxford University Press, but also um, the controllers who had to stay, um, be standards, um, uh, control actually the quality. So he was traveling all over Europe to actually uh, start collecting type specimens. And on the left, you can see some correspondence with Teinhardt that he actually um, discussed whether he would supply type or matrices. In the end, Ma uh, Teinhardt supplied type sorts with him. And going back to the Technique Museum, when I visited it last week even, because it's very new research in this posi position, um, there's also one document on display in their general exhibition, which actually shows the, sh the chart that Teinhardt used to recast the Tibetan type for Oxford, because Oxford in the UK uses a different type height for the printing presses, so all the sorts that were cast in Berlin had to be resized, recast for um, the standards in uh, Oxford or even other presses in the continent. Uh, so this is very unique. Here you can see the full synopsis of it. He even supplied a case lay in order to actually uh, distribute the type in the cases. But I think most people in the room can see that this would rather be a very large type case with individual boxes. So it was not practical at all. So it was completely rejected by uh, the Oxford University Press. And in exchange, they actually provided their own type cases. Um, actually using two different cases and individual compartments with the most frequently used characters at hand sight so that the compositor could easily ta take them themselves. I was privileged to actually able to work with these uh, typefaces from Teinhardt, typeface from Teinhardt in the same Bright library, but unfortunately some of the cases were completely disordered so I had to redistribute everything, actually using luckily using the type case that was provided at Oxford, um, which you can see here. And what I did in this specific case is also um, compare it with other typesetting methods from other foundries, like another one in Britain uh, from Stephen Austin, um, which uses different composing methods. So at St. Bright, I'm very thankful um, to them and also the British Library, because at the time I could actually borrow it as you could see with the cap and transport it to the same bright to actually do the work and setting and produce a type specimen which actually gives the information like how many sorts or individual combinations Tynart actually designed the whole synopsis and also the same kind of text line to compare the size and everything with it. Now this actually gave some inspiration or some insight in the composing methods which is two ways you can do it. This is the degree system, which is like a mosaic that you actually put all the sorts together, the positioning of the vowels where you want it. Um, so that means that some of the characters had to be cast on different bodies. So you can have a full body, but if there needed to be like an accent below or above, it needed to be short, uh, like smaller, so that the total combination could be the same type size, in this case um, 14 points, to actually be combined. And all this um, uh, type from Oxford, supplied also by Tynard, was actually distributed, sold to other foundries in these kind of stock packages. So each individual character that was cast, as you can see here, was printed in stock proof and also given with the case lay so that the printers who would use it knew how to actually distribute it. So that's another detail of the stock proofs and actually the packages that were um, packed. The second uh, method was the Akhan system. It's also an uh, Indian word that actually means shoulder. And as you can see here, it's a more convenient way of composing because the consecutive characters interlock with one each other. So that actually when you've got the whole text, it's less difficult that it would fall apart if you would distribute it to the printing press. Much later, Oxford University Press also made themselves a, a smaller um, type, like the two-line brevier, which is about eight, nine point size in our terms. But they actually used the stereotype way of doing, like meaning by electrolysis, which means you have like a type set page, and then you actually, with like electrolysis, you duplicate it, you, re well, you reduce it uh, in a smaller size and duplicate it with type, which you can see from this specimen from Oxford that 
actually the features become more uh, are, are gone, like it's, it becomes fatter and it's also a bit more uh, heavier and, and bolder. In that sense, uh, the matrices of this case um, are preserved ex at the Oxford University Press. Unfortunately, the original swords from Tynot were completely melted down because they were recast on a different body. And from those matrices, nothing is uh, preserved. Tynhardt's Tibetish, first printed by the Ungor brothers, was actually uh, distributed all over Berlin, like the Drug uh, Germany, I mean, Drugolin, which later became Haag uh, Drugolin office, and later in 1908, and even before, the Berthold foundry actually collected all this, so also the Tynhardt foundry became part of the ba Berthold uh, um, company. Also to the Multiscripts uh, printing house of Leipzig, August Pries, and the uh, book um, binder and also printing house of Augustin in Gluckstadt and Hamburg. In Europe, it was mainly, uh, or not Europe anymore, um, in a sense, in England, it was Oxford University Press, <laughs> Gilbert and Rivington, and William Klaus and Sons, which actually inherited, um, or bought Gilbert and Rivington's, um, um, how should I say, uh, Foundry, Vienna, Holzhausen, and Brill in Leiden, also a very important academic uh, printing house related to uh, the University of Leiden. And the type also traveled to Rome and to Madrid to print other types. Going to Asia, India was the main user of like the Tainar Tibetan. At first and foremost was a Baptist mission press in Calcutta. They had first cast their own type, but they actually changed to the Thine art because it was more economical, because it uses less space to typeset. And I'm not going to name all the other printing uh, houses in India that actually use it, because I really went through all the archives and connected and to see which were uh, printing the other ones. Also um, to Hong Kong, and even uh, the one Tibetan type visit was used in Tokyo by the Tokyo Press in Itarbashi. They actually used like a type that was inspired very closely to the uh, Tynart one. I'm going to show you some examples from these different type founders and type specimens to print very high quality publications. This is a very beautiful example from Drugelin, uh, the Marksteine in Weltliteratur. Um, and there are actually the original matrices from Drugolin still preserved in the Hessische Landesmuseum in uh, Darmstadt. There are 133 of these matrices available. These are the covers of Brill. And these are some beautiful pages of the catalogs that um, the Tokyo Press actually printed uh, to actually catalog all the manuscripts and all the uh, woodblocks preserved in the library here in Tokyo. Even to Kyoto, um, the linguistic word, um, it was used. I did a close investigation, and to my opinion, I think that it's like a type visit. It's not really exactly Tynert, but it might be like a rework if you see some of the details. And so it's very close inspired by it. So that's a good influence about this one. But in Kyoto, they actually printed also the Sanskrit Tibetan dictionary. So it went even, traveled even further than Tokyo. Here's some examples of this. Um, going through the whole history of Tibetan printing types, the one from Tynart indeed is like the one in the list that you can see that actually has the better legibility of all the existing uh, printing types, I'm saying. Also, uh, the improved uh, typesetting, so it was more economical than all the previous ones. And it was also the first original design. So it was not copied from previous or uh, uh, accompanying uh, type foundries or catalogs uh, from other printing houses in Europe. So in that sense, although that Tynart was a very modest and silent man, and he was very passionate about his job, um, his legacy actually moved on even to today, because his, Tyner, his typefaces were also a very important source to two very well-used or very uh, largely used typeface uh, fonts uh, uh, nowadays. One is Tibetan Machine, which you can see it's very close. 
uh, system phone of macOS 1005, but then it was replaced by Kyliza, which is now one of the two default fonts uh, of the Mac operating system. And this was designed by the Japanese Shojiro Nomura and Steve Hartwell. And this one actually proves to be very legible in very small sizes. So it functions also very close and very well uh, on uh, screen and web environments. Um, I know that the time is very limited, so in that sense, um, the very detailed narrative of this story, also the details of um, Tynard's life, career, and everything, um, will be published in my book called Tibetan Type Force, and I'm very pleased to say that it will be published by the end of this year by the publishing house at Geverij de Buitenkant in the Netherlands. So I know it was a bit rushed and everything, but I hope um, that I showed you a bit of inspiration and that I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much and hope to see you very soon. Thank you.